Yes, Steven, my phone is on vibrate. Just making sure. But I was sitting here, I'm like, I got my new highlighters. You know, I've got my whole cup because I got some <laughs> you got like soup. got 30 of them. Well, yeah, they were $8.99 at BJ's. I got my whole soup container because I had soup from the Chinese restaurant yesterday. I get chicken noodle soup. After, I did it after yoga, mm -hmm. which was good. So I'm here and I'm highlighting pink and I'm like, why do they give you so many yellow? The reason is because yellow is just so much easier to read. Pink, I can't read the text. And beyond that, it's like... It's it it's not drawing a straight line. Well, isn't yellow the original highlighter color too? I don't know. I should have probably just bought highlighter brand instead of Sharpie brand. I don't well, know, I'm sure Sharpie's this, still good. Doesn't just piss you off. You see this? What is that? It's leaving streaks. It's leaving streaks. Not that's good. one pink that's leaving a streak. Let's try another pink. It looks purple too. It the other look pink. No, that's pink, bro. You need to get your eyes checked. That's pink. That's that's bright ass pink. Let's try a third one. That looks more purple to me. Even more streaks. Let's try another one. I think every one of these highlight. Uh, this is the only good pink highlighter. So this is garbage. This is garbage. <laughs> this is garbage. Just making sure I don't hit the uh, deep west. And then this page is garbage. What was on that page? This was my notes. That was your test highlight page? Yeah, but then I got more notes because I had a second page printed there too. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> getting rid of these because now I'm going to just use my yellow highlighter. I think you'll have enough highlighters for the next like eight years. I love highlighters. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com and welcome to another Raw Talk episode. This week we are at episode number 78 with a very special guest who you will be seeing later on in the show, Matis Yahoo. We will also be releasing his uh, new single, his latest single from his album at the very end of this episode, only on the audio portion of the podcast, will you be getting the full single to hear at the very end of the show. And I guess if you're listening to the audio podcast on Monday between noon and this is Monday, March. Are we in March? Yeah, we're in March. March 24th. So that's Monday, March 24th, which is the day that we release the Raw Talk audio portion between noon noon Eastern time at midnight. You can go to modestyahooworld.com and you'll be able to download this as a single. So if you guys have been signed up for the podcast and you get the notifications when they go live and you check on Monday, you're going to have a good chance that you will be getting this to go get that free single. Uh, so you can do that. How are my levels, by the way? Should be good. They should be good. Let me, let me check with Sutter. Sutter, how are my... <laughs> S Sutter! <laughs> Steven Sutter! Where are... Steven Sutter's chair is empty this week. He's missing. He's been... Where'd he go? <laughs> Where's Steven... Where in the world is Steven, Steven Sutter? Sutter? I don't even know how you would say that. What? How you would sing it. Carmen Sandiac, Steven... There's not enough... Uh... Steven Sutter. <laughs> not enough syllables. Where in the world is the hipster? <laughs> uh, anyway, Sutter is not here this week. He is with... He is he's going, at Pizza Brain working. He's not at Pizza Brain working. <laughs> he's actually going to a bunch of different national parks. The kid loves traveling and going to different things, cool. different parks. So he picked up, I saw his Instagram, which is Stephen underscore Sutter, I yeah, believe. Yeah, it is. At Stephen underscore Sutter. We're even plugging him. He's not even here. <laughs> but he, you can follow along. He, he's got like a passport book that's for the national parks. So whenever you go to one, they stamp in your book. That's cool. I thought that was pretty cool. So he's, his goal is to go to like every national park in the, in the country. How long is he going to be gone for? I think he only said a week this time. Really? And he's going to go to every one? No, no. This is just some up to Connecticut oh. and back. I thought you meant now he's doing nah, he that. I would need like a summer He for wants that. to go on the Appalachian Trail and actually take five months to do it and walk the whole way. Hey, I mean, if he can do it, why not? Hey. Especially when he's this young. Exactly. When you're young, you want to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so first things first... Let's talk about Rode Microphone. They've got that competition still going on uh, where you can get 70000 You can win $70,000 in prizes. Go to their website. It's Rode Mics or Google Rode Microphones. Check out this contest. You, you really want to try it out. When they are giving you the opportunity to win something like this, all of these prizes... Uh, you don't have to be a professional. You could just have a D3100 that does video and create something that captures the imagination and the attention of the judges that are judging the Rode microphone contest or the Rode contest where you could end up winning. I mean, whenever they give you a chance to enter something and win, and it's pretty much free, I think one of the rules are that you have to have a Rode mic involved in it. Well, you could rent one. You could also buy a smart lav. You, in my opinion, I, I, you, you can't just take a box and write Rode on it. I don't yeah. think you can do that. I I would I would actually try that because that would be funny. I wonder if it's but, in the rules. Well, I don't know, but you, you know, 
whatever whatever it is you could pick up a road smart lab they're like 69 bucks they're gonna come in handy put that in the in, in the video somewhere and i think you'll be good to go but definitely check it out you can go on fronosphoto.com there's an ad that pops up on the right hand side that has the uh, contest uh banner and you take you over to their site but really i wish i could enter i'm not allowed to enter they won't let me do it and that's me just that so yeah you're not allowed to enter sutter can enter because he's not working he's just here when he's here uh so that's it check out road microphones we are using the road broadcasters for anybody that uh, asks on the uh when i sit at my computer i use the road podcaster which mm -hmm. is the usb version uh, and i also use the smart lab from time to time and oh the road classic 2 which Ooh, is like we two thousand dollars guy up i have to put that video and wait to set that guy up anyway that's enough about road definitely check out that contest and we're going to move on to uh well we shot maria this week we did you got yeah that was fun that so was anyway fun. we did a five minute portrait with maria uh that was 45 ish minutes long, long. I, it was using the d4s using a 14 to 24 24 to 70 70 to 200 and then a big piece of glass that's part of gear this week that we'll talk about later and steven was there to film it we mm -hmm. had the first person shooter going and it's really just following me through the entire photo shoot and it was in a gym too which was pretty cool <laughs> was that the right sound for that photo shoot? That was uh, that's pretty good sound. To, so Maria to sum it goes up. like this: Guys, I brought two. Sh I brought a shirt and a sports bra. <laughs> what should I wear? What was my answer? What did you say? You were like, I said, Maria, really? you don't even need to, need yeah, to ask that question. It. I want to see the sports bra. Yeah, she's uh, what is she a, a yoga or just she's no, an no, instructor she, in general? She's, right? She does boqua, which is some kind of dancing fitness thing. She's a fitness girl. She does Very a fit. lot of. Fi she's more fit than a yoga instructor. Yeah. Yoga instructors, they're fit in their own way, but she is definitely put together very well. She's a beautiful girl, yeah. So this is going to be a cool photo shoot. I'm not sure when we're putting it out yet, but it's going to be pretty... Actually, I have to wait till I can process the, process the raw images. files. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. And then you and I shot in the pit. Yes. At the Arcade Fire. Uh, ar sorry, Arcade Fire show. Yep. Um, this was... Terrible Well, experience. before we even got into the pit... We had like 12 different photographers. I know that we there were like six or seven different bloggers there that are for little blogs. You got the, what's it called, Stereo Gum? They're a pretty big blog. They're not a blog. They're a pretty big music news site. Are they? Yeah. And they had the, I believe the kid's name's Eric and he wears a skinny tie. Yeah, they're I up like there with kid, like though. Pitchfork and stuff. They're are not they? as big, but yeah. They're not they're, as big. I liked him. He's cool. He hangs out. I haven't seen his work. I know you took a look. You, you can see the stuff that he's done there, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of bloggers and then you got the a, uh, the I don't even say AP services. people anymore, but you got the wired services there. And go ahead, what 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 happened in the pit? Uh, well, basically it was it was really packed. There was more people than normal at that show because it's a big show as well as Fargo Center. It was an arena, and Arcade Fire is a pretty big band these days. But anyway, we get in the pit, and they stopped us the first song because they basically show up at the opposite side of the arena as well, like a fake band. Well, well I don't know if they that. said fake band, but they told us that we would get three songs. No, because it was just a singer on the other side with fake right. members. So what they told us, we went into the pit before the show started, mm -hmm. and we realized that there's a big block in the middle of the pit, so you literally have half a pit. They wouldn't let half the photographers go to the other side, which was bullshit. They should have, yeah. They should have split us up. It would have been much better. Plus, it would give them better results, not that they care, Um it's not the band's choosing, it's the security and whoever's running that. But it was so, the band's security, though. Right. We were trying to get permission to have half the people go to the other side and half the people go here. The Live Nation people couldn't pull any strings. And they tried. They did they, try. They did try. They weren't... Yeah, they don't usually want to try. But they actually did, which I was surprised. Right. They tried, but it doesn't matter when it's two minutes before the show starts. So what happens is there's a song that starts playing... There's a big the uh, like the, pop up the, stage. Well, the drape is still on the screen on the stage, yeah, meaning on the main stage. On the main stage, the curtain. So the the singer starts all the way at the other side by the soundboard. Then he comes walking back, goes up on stage. They drop the curtain. Then they got to run with, get the curtain out of there, and then they let us into the pit. So we basically went in the the one and a half songs in. Right, but that's supposed to be our first song. Exactly. So I actually have a GoPro angle of this, and you can hear me yelling at the guy i yelled not yelled because it's dark i mm -hmm. mean it's loud so i'm just like that's two songs basically they kicked us out at the uh when the third song started it wasn't even two songs it was a song yeah. and a half it was a song and a half and the guy's like i don't care yeah he's like that's two so the first song i'm like dude you're standing here how are we we couldn't you, we, 
the first song wasn't even a song. It's like an intro. Well, basically, I, I got stuck in the back. Yeah. So I was really screwed because I had the worst possible angle. I couldn't get a full wide angle shot of the entire band. It was nearly impossible. There was a video guy yeah. in front of us on a dolly track, yep. which... I was right behind him and I couldn't stand on my step stool and he was probably a good two feet up yeah. from me. So I got nearly nothing I, besides the front man, Wynn Butler. That's really it. Right. And, and I, I got into the pit pretty quick because you know, I you were up there in the front. I yeah. was up near the front and um, you'll see, I'm going to do a whole commentary with o- over the, the, the song, the, uh, sorry, the, the GoPro angle, which was still about 15 minutes or 30. Cause I guess that first song is pretty long. Yeah. It was but a I, long song. I get into the pit. I've got my 24 to 70 on. I have the backpack on and I'm hand holding the, the lens that the, that we'll talk about is a 200 to 400 that I got from borrow lenses because I figured I'd try using it. I was supposed to shoot from the soundboard. They actually weren't letting me shoot from the soundboard. That's why I ended up in the pit. Yeah, I would have been much happier. If and I did felt that. like a dick with that backpack on. Cause I'm like Boba Fett because it has the, sorry for you, Star Wars fans, Boba Fett <laughs> out there with the, the, the monopod, just like him. the monopod on the one side, mm-hmm. it's, you know, sticking up like a t- antenna. And then I just like, I'm moving around and I don't want to hit people. What are you looking at? I was gonna say, you have it right there. I have it back. over there. We'll bring it out during the okay. gear of the week. Um, oh yeah. We got to watch the clock We're this good. week cause Sutter isn't here. Yeah. Um, so I just felt terrible, but I shot with a 24 to 70. Of course, the 70 to 200 would have been a better option from where I was. That's and then what I, I did. Then I whipped out the 200 to 400 handheld. <laughs> trying, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, whoop, whoop. And I'm trying not to hit people, which nobody gave me shit, but I really felt like a dick. I really did. I felt like Edgar was in the pit with us, but he wasn't. <laughs> Edgar wasn't there. Well, Edgar, with his 400 Edgar in the pit has, he's got a 200 to 400. He'll have a 300 to 8 over one arm. He'll have his assistant standing over to the side holding another two cameras and he'll just motor drive eight trillion photos because that's what paparazzis do probably ends up with like a two thousand photos in with a six minute song and then after that's done they have them uploaded within four minutes it's crazy so they're out onto the wire very quick and if you want to be successful as a paparazzi you want to get that stuff up he's there before anybody he's, else. Great. he's very good at it i don't like the style of shooting i don't like the style of that type of photography in general but edgar's a woman by the way um so <laughs> Just in case Edgar's listening. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was that. Uh, I know, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the easiest shoot. Well, the other thing is we all agreed in the beginning, like, oh, let's move around. We got to rotate. Don't all stay at the front, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll chime in the back because I got there a little late anyway. So I'm in the back and no one's rotating, but it's understandable because we only had that limited space. Yeah, there was nowhere to move. So you got in front of the video guy where I, did. I was behind him. And but then I ended I tried, up moving. Yeah, and then I tr- you did. You, you were the only one that actually rotated. Then I went to step on my step stool. Again, I was in the way back. No one's behind me. I'm not, I'm not blocking anyone, even fans, and their security well, guard who kicked us out early flipped out and was like, what are you doing? I'm like, My favorite what? is that, you know, the pit's already packed enough. Live Nation has like, there are two main people and two two interns standing there taking exactly. up space, that holding the up their iPhones, taking pictures. It's like, give me a freaking break. You give us shit about getting passes and you're, you're sitting here in the pit taking photos with your iPhone. Give me a break. And the worst part was that one of them went up to get video and he gets right in front of me and sticks his hand up. And I'm like, dude, what do you... Like, I didn't know who and he he's was. Working. Yeah, I don't know if he was for Live Nation or for the band, so I didn't give there, him anything. And there but. was also one guy in the pit who was uh, primarily just... He had a camera, but he was using his phone the whole time. Yeah, and then there's the one guy who was in live view, putting his hand yeah. his, and not doing video, but doing stills. And I'm like, "What are you doing, man?" Like, and he hit my, I think he hit my 7200 like five, ten times. Oh, and the and the last thing about the concert, this was the first show that I got to wear my new custom earplugs in. Yes, you heard me. You heard what I had to say about that. Mm-hmm. They were I. I had to check to make sure they were in. Everything sounded so clean and crisp and and just great. They were unbelievable. They make me. They, it makes me think that I should have bought them five, six years ago and spent the money, which I should have done because they're so much more comfortable than the the Edematic Research ones are great for twelve bucks. But the way that these custom earplugs are in my ears, the way that they filtered the music down twenty five decibels to where it was just amazing sounding was unbelievable well worth the hundred it cost me 200 bucks with the uh, 170 bucks to, to pay for them and then it was like 25 dollars to have the uh the mold. the mold made the at the audiologist that's awesome so it was pretty I, cool i actually forgot my earplugs for the my, that was my first show i think ever since my actual first show that i forgot my earplugs and i was really pissed and no one had any extras, so unfortunately, I shot it I without. I had extras. You just didn't ask. Well, I yelled it, but it was so loud because the concert was playing. Oh, I didn't playing. hear you. I didn't, didn't hear, hear it. You. Yeah. I had my earplugs in. And you had your earplugs in yeah, on top of that. Steven. What's up? Guess what time it is. 
Uh, photo news time. Photo news time. All right, well, I'm actually going to reset the cameras. I'll reset the cameras. You right, start you talking. Reset. I'll right. be the Steven Sutter this week. All right, that's cool. Wait, hold uh, on. I'm Steven Sutter. <laughs> Let me tight roll my jeans. <laughs> and where's like your orange cap and your sweet, sweet stash? Well, you do have a sweet stash, but not as sweet as his. Uh, first up, I just want to thank you guys for um, sending all your photo news submissions to me on Twitter. I mean, I get a bunch every week and I really do appreciate it. I do read them all. So there's a lot of times where I can't include them all because we try and cut this down to maybe 20 minutes uh, a segment. But, you know, I, I do what I can as far as reading all them and checking them out. And, uh, and I do thank you for that. And also, I want to thank you guys for anyone who contributed to my race that I will be running this Sunday, which at the time of this recording is going to, by the time this comes out, it'll be this past Sunday. But we, uh, we raised, I think, about 300 bucks at least at now. Um, so I do want to thank you guys for that, whoever contributed and donated. I really, really appreciate that. Um, so thank you again. But first up for photo news for those Game of Thrones fans, a new behind the scenes video showcasing Annie Leibovitz photo shoot with the cast uh, for Vanity Fair is now online. Now, as far as gear goes, from what I can tell from the video, which by the way, the behind the scenes video was really bad. I think yeah, it was, the behind the scenes is terrible. It was shot by her sister. Um, I her sister. Her, her sister apparently. But there's no like audio at all. There's no commentary. There's nothing. It's just like video, and it just describes absolutely nothing which, about what it, went into the shoot. It was cool watching the shoot. It was. Cool. It was windy as hell. I'm surprised really they got what they got. I, did they need to go there to get the photo like that? Probably, Probably not. not, but that's where they're filming. Mm -hmm. um, Annie Leibovitz must have gotten paid. She gets so, I think she's like a million dollars a shoot or something. Oh, I don't know what I she can gets only paid. Imagine. It's pretty interesting, though. I think she was using a, I reset it. Oh, nice. I think it was like a Canon or something. Uh, she was, was actually a using a Hassie. It was a Hassie. I couldn't tell what series, but it was an H series, but with a uh, phase back and it looked like a 50 to 110 millimeter lens. And as far as the lights go, I think they were pro photo lights with uh, 46 inch Fotec. Uh, soft lighters as far as the soft boxes and all that goes. Um, that's at least what, from what I can tell from reading comments and stuff like that. So she's she's it, shooting with a ton of gear. Oh, I she mean, always shoots end. with a ton of gear. Yeah. I mean, it, it so helps when you've got 27 assistants going out there. So not, many. Not downplaying her success in any no, way. not at all. I respect her work now. I enjoyed her work more when she was the shooting the rolling as a Rolling Stone photographer, as a college girl, mm -hmm. totally different thing because I'm more drawn to that style of work. But I understand the shift, the paradigm shift that she's done over the last decade or so to go into the the setup type stuff. I mean, her the, she gets access to the queen and the, the photos with the queen are, are unbelievable. So she gets the great access to do whatever she wants because of who she is. And she has the help of the assistants. Yes, she is the visionary behind the shoots because she comes up with the ideas mm -hmm. and they help get all the stuff where it needs to go. She comes in and she shoots it. It's cool. It's not my style, but I like I do like the results. And she still does work with a lot of bands as far as just like more regular shoots go, more common shoots where it's just her. There's no lights. There's no assistance. I've seen that with like a Death Cab for Cutie she worked with. I think she has a whole photo book with them actually that she did. So she is still doing that kind of stuff uh, on the side as well. Uh, moving on, we have one of my favorite stories this week. A photojournalist was given the Humanitarian Award for choosing to help out a non-breathing baby rather than photograph the scene, uh, which is tough for a photo journalist to do. Back in February, Miami Herald photojournalist Al Diaz saw a woman stopped outside her SUV on Florida State Road 836 and uh, helped her flag down a police officer to aid the baby, uh, which was her nephew, not her baby, who had stopped breathing because of apparently tracheal cysts. And tracheal now, cysts. Yeah, I'm not sure what they are. but That means cysts in the tracheal. In the tracheal, yeah. Now, once the scene was clear and everything under control, he did kick into photojournalist mode and uh, did pick up his camera, but that was after the baby was breathing again and, and everything was good to go. Uh, NPPA President Mark Dolan had this to say about the events and why Diaz was given the humanitarian award. So, in quote, I think Al's actions exemplify the ethical and humanitarian standard that MPPA was taken, has taken over the years. It's important for all photojournalists to remember that you don't have to lay down your, humani your humanity when you pick up a camera. Al did just that. He put the welfare of the child first and made sure he did all that he could do. And it wasn't until he realized that things were all well in other people's sure hands that he took up his camera and began making images. And they were incredible images at that, end quote. So, again, we're all human. I mean, you do the right thing first, then you pick up the camera. We're only <laughs> human. Well, I bleed the same as you. I'm only human. And a lot of people so will argue who that. Sings but that? Uh, your girl. And Christina Perry. Christina Perry, It's yeah. her new single. That's it. Human. <laughs> Coming up next, this is Christina Perry singing Human. I'm only human. I bleed the same as...
is you. I don't know the words to this song, so maybe I'll just sing Jar of Hearts. You want to? You remember Jar of Hearts? Uh, it's been a while. How's got, it go again? I forget. Wait, we got to we got to remember the Jar of <laughs> Hearts. We got to remember Jar of Hearts. That was her first big one, right? Was oh, that her first that break? Oh, that was the huge, huge one. How does it go? I'm surprised you you forgot of all people. You're usually really Jar of Hearts. <laughs> Does Jar it, of Hearts. I, I, I even know what it's about, too. Well, I'll start reading when you remember, which I'm sure you will kick in. You keep reading. And cut me off. I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go get my phone. <laughs> All right. Uh, popular camera store chain Calumet pho- uh, Photography has filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy without even warning their employees. So here's what they had to say about the closing. Uh, apparently, according to their Facebook page. Actually, let me let me let me butt in. <laughs> What, the, do you remember the, the differ- no, 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 not the song. But the difference between Chapter 11 in the United States uh-huh. and Chapter 7. Uh, 11 is bankruptcy, where you're, you're, your thing is you're trying to save the company by going into bankruptcy in the hopes that you will be able to come back out of bankruptcy as a, smart, uh, as a better company. Chapter 7 is when you liquidate everything and you're just totally you're shutting done. down the business. Interesting. I did not know that. Um, so again, here's what they had to say regarding the closing, um, according to their Facebook page. Uh, in quotes, after 75 years of business, it is with a heavy heart that we announce our immediate closing in the United States. Uh, our, European st- our European stores will continue to be open. It has been a joy to share our passion for photography with you all of these years. We'll miss each other and we'll miss all of our customers. Thank you for everything, end quote. Um, and the court papers show that Calumet is declaring less than $50,000 in assets and between $1 million and $10 million in liabilities. Uh, according to a Calumet... Which means they owe $10 million exactly. to somebody, like Nikon, but they all have insurance to protect themselves. And now, according to a Calumet employee, management was notified of this decision the night before and told not to open for work the next day. Employees are still basically waiting to hear when or if they'll be allowed to go back into the store and collect their personal belongings from, say, their desk or office. And uh, I think they were also saying that like uh, people who had rented gear out yeah. from the store and stuff like that, you know, they're just pretty much keeping it, I guess, because the stores <laughs> are just closed. So they got lucky with that stuff. Did you, did you hear the song? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I had to go listen to it. It's, it's <laughs> who do you think you are? That's it, yeah. Going around leaving scars, <laughs> collecting your jar of hearts, tearing love apart. You're gonna catch a cold with the ice inside your soul. <laughs> who do you think you are? Something your jar of hearts. It was written. It that was, was written around song. the corner, by the way, yeah. in Fishtown. I know. I was know it what Fishtown? it's about. Yeah. Wow. Well, I was at the house where when when Nick used to live there. I um. It's about a certain somebody. Oh, I know what it's about. I don't know if she's ever told the story, but I know what it's about. Hmm. Interesting. Who do you think you are? I want to do it better. I want to do it better. Hold on. Let me check my vocal. Let me do my vocal warm ups. Where's your honey at? This is what artists really do, by the way, for those wondering. They sit there backstage going, me, 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 me. When we do studio sessions at the station. I sound like Beaker. I was going to say, you sound like Beaker, yeah. Me, me, me. Who do you think you are? Going around leaving scars. Collecting your jar of hearts. Tearing love apart, you're gonna catch a cold from the ice inside your soul. Who do you think you are? That was much better. It was was it better? That was better. I'm trying with my vocal warmups. I have to really get into the get into the feeling, and I'm <laughs> rubbing my breasts doesn't help me get my vocal cords warmed up. Um, I like singing, but yeah, for the, for those wondering, like I said, they, they do actually do that. Like when we have the green room in our studio sessions, we have artists come in, they got their honey, their tea, and they're just like, oh, throat coat. Yeah. And they're going back and forth, you know, octave up and down and all that stuff. That's I mean. If, if people it actually works, get though, to I mean, keep their, the used gear or the, the rental gear, that's pretty interesting. That's awesome. I'm like say you rented out like a one DX with like a two to 400, just anything. <laughs> anything. Yeah. Anyway, that would be really cool. Uh, all right. So moving on, we have photographer. Well, Hold on. You want me to continue or just well, talk no, about no, the story? Let me, let me just go on with the, the Calumet thing. Okay. The, you're going to see more and more stores shutting down. Oh, yeah. Calumet was all across the country, multiple stores. Um, I look at a company, uh, Allen's. I look at Allen's. Yep. Right? I shop at Allen's. I bought my D4S there, and a lot of people know that I shop there. That is a, a one store 
shop. Yeah. It's been, he's been in business for 35 or 34 or 35 years at this point. Uh, I believe he started when he was about 19. Wow. So he's been cranking away. He's been working all his life. His brother actually owns another store, an electronic store down the street, hmm. if you didn't know that. But when you are one store... And you are the owner operator of that store. You can keep a handle on everything so much easier. We've seen this with Ritz. I mean, Ritz was a almost two thousand store company back in the day, just over bloated. But they were the place where everybody went because there weren't websites to go buy stuff from. I don't know how a store can stay successful in the next ten years, other than the B and H's, the Adoramas, the the superstores, the superstores, yeah. the uh, digital revs, the superstores that are out there. Allen's can stay successful because they're small. They're so they can do a tremendous amount of business and cha- they can compete on price with the big the big stores. They can get the inventory that Calumet couldn't get. They had trouble getting stuff because Allen has has forged these relationships over the years. I don't know, you know, who knows where the business is going. You know, I, I obviously a lot of it's online. You still want to be able to hold camera gear, but it's just I well, I went to Best Buy the other day and I bought something for the for the iMac and I went into the photo section. The guy's like, "Can I help you?" He didn't. He didn't know me. Didn't know me. <laughs> oh, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You should have brought the camera. No, in. I didn't do it. <laughs> but but I was just going. Their photo section is so crappy now. I, I mean, my mine in um, in New Jersey hasn't really changed. That photo section has been about the same. They have no good glass there. No, there's no good glass, but they have decent bodies. I mean, when I went, there was actually a 5D Mark III, I believe. Wow. Um, and a couple other. I mean, they have a lot of Rebels and, and that kind of stuff, but they're still good bodies. Um, but yeah, I think what, what's going to happen is those stores are going to be more generic and broad for like the moms that don't know what they're getting and they need to run to the store to get like you know, something uh, technology based, but for the real specific items, they're going to start weeding them out and that's going to be an online only kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, Best Buy already is starting to do that. Yeah. Like really specific stuff. So we'll see. Next up we have photographer. You showed me this uh, Platon, I think is his name. He explains how he captured the haunting image of Vladimir Putin for the uh, cover of the time magazine of time magazine, and a new behind the scenes video saying he was only about an inch away from his face and how he could feel his, br- uh, feel him breathing and everything. He Smell describes like vodka. <laughs> he describes how he In was Porsche. sent to, uh, to Moscow and basically was led into the building by like 10 bodyguards. Gunpoint. Uh, gunpoint, yeah, all kinds of crazy stuff. They talked about the Beatles. He got them to open up and, and really kind of got to know him for the brief time, the 10 minutes he had with them. But it's a really interesting video and it's really short and sweet, but it's it's it really tells you something. Yeah, click click over to the website. The link, obviously, it's uh, this one's going to be fronosphoto.com slash Raw talk. Raw talk. Raw talk hyphen 78. 78. Yep. Uh, so that's where you can get all the photo news. The link is always there in, in uh, well, you can click podcast on the website or, or, or raw talk and all the photo stories are there. This video, it's short, like Steven said, but it is right to the point and it's really awesome to hear that story. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, the guy has a lot of interesting things to say about him. Uh, a new civil code in Hungary makes it illegal to take photographs without obtaining permission from everybody in the photos, basically making street photographers and photojournalists' jobs much harder. Uh, the new law expands current regulations that prohibited the public- publication of images without consent. Uh, supposedly in Hungary, reporters already have to blur out policemen's faces when they take their picture. Uh, so now it looks like anyone can sue if you take their picture without permission. The question is, you know, do you shoot first, then ask for permission, or do you ask permission? first what is that legal status you know so i got nothing for this one because i'm not in hungary so yeah yeah it's just uh i I wonder if other places are going to follow suit for this i wonder wonder who be doobie who (laughs) who wrote the book of love (gasps) tell me why oh why i love that song don't you love that song remind me of who sings that I don't know. I've heard it before, but Tell I... Tell me wonder, wonder, who be do be do. I'll look it up. I don't really want to know. I'm not going to... I'll look it up. <laughs> I don't really this? care. I'm going to look it up. You can look it up. Who wrote uh, the book I'll of probably love? never... Like, let me do it. I'm doing it right now. Never listen. You're going to... What are you going to sing? I mean, you're going to keep no, going? No, I'll, I'll keep going. So South, South African portrait photographer Albert Bredenhan photographed a woman named Gertie McKenna who was suffering from breast cancer and all of her friends shave their heads for a photo shoot without her knowing at first. Uh, there's a beautiful behind the scenes video of the whole thing. It's, it's very touching. Um, it allows her, it basically shows her reaction. Tell me why. Well, let me finish the story the before you do it. Love. Ooh. Okay. 
it basically shows her reaction to seeing her friends for the first time after shaving their heads. And I mean, again, it's it's a very touching moment. Uh, all of their ha- all of the hair was then donated to Cancer, which which is Cancer Association of South Africa. And here's what the photographer had to say about the whole experience. Uh, in quotes, it was an honor as as a photographer to capture these memories forever. I never thought being a photographer could be so satisfying and rewarding. You're good. As portrait photographers, we should always remember that we are working with people, feelings, and emotions. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is definitely a story to check out. There's behind the scenes photos, uh, of them actually shaving their head. There's a uh, video of the whole thing. I mean, it's just, again, a, a very, a very beautiful video in general. And I mean, this kind of hits home for, for me and you with, uh, with my friend recently passing last week and, and all that. So, uh, yeah, definitely check this one out. You want me to keep going? No, I'm back. All I right. I wanted to reset the cameras. I'm, d- you know, doing stutter. Taking your, uh, you're taking your time. I was doing stutter's job. Yeah. All right, uh, so it was the monotones. Who wrote the book of love? Anyway. Yeah, I don't really care. I know. <laughs> I, sorry. That, that anyways, it also reminded me of a movie, um, a new movie. It's not a Bette Midler and, uh, and uh, da, 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 what the hell is his name? Mike, uh, Mike from uh, Monsters, Inc., Billy Crystal. They do a movie together that's, that's funny. It's about kids and uh, parent something or other. Parental Guidance. It's called Parental Guidance. Yeah. It was on HBO. Not the greatest movie in the world, but I found it to be cute and funny. I thought it was good. I liked it. They sing that in the song. That's why. Whatever. Is that anyway, a newer, video, newer song? or No, that's an old, it's an old, old, old song, 50s right? doo-wop yeah, song. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's yeah. what I thought. Is that all your photo news? No, no, no. I have more. I didn't know if you want I'll to chime stop. in. I'll stop. I'll be quiet. <laughs> Now you're going to stop. Swiss photographer Daniel Bouchung, I think is how you pronounce it, has created an automated portrait machine composed of an industrial strength robotic arm, custom software, uh, a Canon EOS Mark II, 5D Mark II uh, mounted, and a 180 millimeter macro lens converted into a telecentrical lens, which takes 900 megapixel high detailed portraits, which is crazy. Uh, It was made up to map out face cartography. Every portrait consists of around 600... 600 shots stitched together and the subject has to stay there still for 30 minutes while the machine does its thing and I guess he stitches it in post. I'm assuming manually because there's no way someone can stay still for that long amount of time, especially some of these um, subjects were you know, older and I'm sure they can't stay in one spot That's for that racism, long. Steven. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's racist. All right, whatever. There's a gallery on the site, though, that allows you to zoom in on every detail of the actual photograph. It's crazy how much how, how much detail there is. And there's also a video of the machine in action and how he's stitching it and that kind of stuff. But, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know exactly why he did this. Did you know you spit on your paper? Oh, I did spit on my paper. That's a pretty nice spit, too. <laughs> I just, I, just I, I saw it happen. No, thank you for pointing that in out. slow and, motion. And, Showing everyone else, too. You're welcome. I wonder if they caught it in your angle or not. <laughs> I don't know, but that's a, that was a pretty nice wad right there. Um, so this is awesome. The people over at Corridor Digital released a point-of-view GoPro video of what it would look like if Spider-Man strapped on the camera while flying. Spider-Man or Superman? I'm sorry. Superman, not Get your Spider-Man. DC comic universe right. <laughs> I don't actually know anything about comics, so don't yell at me for not knowing who's DC and who's Marvel. Yeah, I always get them screwed up, too. I think Marvel's Batman, isn't he? I don't, I don't know. Ask Kevin Smith. Don't ask me. I don't know. Uh, but obviously, the point of view footage wasn't actually shot by Superman. It was shot by a guy, by um, a GoPro Hero 3 and a DJI, DJI Phantom 2 quadcopter. They posted a whole oh, behind the scenes copter? video. It's a quadcopter, yeah. Exactly. Not a drone. They posted a whole behind the scenes video of how they did it as well. It's really interesting stuff. Um, and the way they cut it together, too, they would show them like kind of taking off, and then they would do a real quick jump cut to the actual Phantom taking off, and they did it really well. It, what, what's cool, again, we talked about the Phantom last week, yeah. is that it, you're going to see more and more interesting uses. Uh, mate, what was that? Was that my your floor phone? Vibrating? Is your oh, phone down there? Yeah, my phone's down yeah. there. That's why it's normally not there. I thought that was outside like a horn. But the DJ, I'm waiting for mine to come in. They, they are, everyone they make, they have to ship out because they're making them and selling them as soon as they make them, which really? is great. Well, because I'm talking to the guy from over there uh, and we're just waiting to get our test unit to, to bring it in and, and fly it around the loft and try not to break anything and, and whatever. So Yeah, this is cool because they inserted like his, his obviously his, his elbows and hands in as, as, as if he was flying, like a first person That's point cool. of view. Um, and then they showed like him going by like a burning building and then like picking up a random person and saving her and that kind of stuff. But the Save way they me, Superman. The, the editor behind this, I think, is the, the most important one because um, he really did a great job editing this. Uh, and then we have a couple more stories. Website Recode is reporting that Yahoo is getting ready to redesign Flickr yet again. Uh, it's said to be coming 
going within the next few weeks. Not a major over- overhaul this time, but the goal for this update is to simplify and unify the mobile and web browser Flickr experiences. Uh, a few changes include removing of the annoying purple Yahoo toolbar at the top, finally, and removing uh, most of the text and buttons from the screen. So it's going to be a very clean experience, um, just like the mobile app already it has. It is confusing. Flickr is kind of confusing. It is kind of confusing. Since they did that major overhaul the first time, I haven't really been on it that much. But uh, I should use it more often. I haven't updated it. I in just like use a it as a, a repository for my photos. A like repository. A repository. The yeah. book repository. I know. You know the suppository. <laughs> suppository. That's what we said last time. <laughs> the, um, I I put it up. I use it because it's just so easy for me to put up the high res. It converts them into smaller files that I can grab and use for thumbnails. I can embed them on my site for for. Uh, for the for the blog, really easy. You grab the code, you put it right in. It's so easy to use. Uh, that's why I use it. Now you want to use 500 picks. You want to use. I don't care what you use. I personally use the Flickr because I mean it's still getting 50 to 100 thousand views a day on my Flickr. I looked at the the stats. I rarely look at the stats there, but that's what they are. So if people are viewing the images there. I'm I'll keep putting them there. Yeah, I get about three to four thousand, um, and I like I said haven't updated it in forever. The only thing I hate is that when I did use it about I don't know a couple of years back when I really used it a lot as my portfolio is the one thing I basically recompressed all the videos as that size of the viewer which was perfect then because it didn't do a great job Flickr didn't like resizing them um, but now I regret that because now they're much smaller and, and stretched and doesn't look that good anymore so I might as well just start over one day on Squarespace the one website I have to uh, get together all right speaking of Squarespace <laughs> might as well just let you know because somebody asked last week what the code was they mm-hmm. weren't aware of this if you go to squarespace.com slash fro you will get a 14 day free trial if you want to sign up and try it you actually signing up is simple you don't have to give them any other information than i guess your email address and your name and you get started with a 14 day free trial at the end of those 14 days if you would like to sign up for their service for any period of time you can use the code raw talk or fro or FroTube. They're all the same. They're all going to give you 10% off your first order, meaning if you sign up for a year, it's going to cost you about 86 bucks for the lowest end version, which is actually what I signed up for. I used the basic package. If you feel that you need more, then just go ahead and sign up for the more one. That's up to you. So squarespace.com slash fro, uh, and that's those are the codes. You can go to that link, and you can get Squarespace. You can try it out yourself. We have two more stories to finish up photo news this week. We have Getty in bed. We wanted to clarify some things uh, from last week's news story. We basically found out what the actual proper term non-commercial use means. You yeah. had talked to them on the phone. I did. I, I just I called them on the phone because we ran into Fusco, mm-hmm. who was on a one Getty of the Raw Talks. He image. shoots for Getty, so he's not sure whether he likes it or doesn't mm-hmm. like the fact that, for anybody that doesn't know, Getty has made available 35 million images for non-commercial use that can be embedded on any website for no charge. Mm-hmm. That that also means that the photographers don't get paid for their work that's going out there, which isn't a good thing. Nope. Now, it's too early to tell whether the photographers are going to lose money from this. We will know in a matter of months whether they are, which we'll follow up with the people that we know that are Getty photographers. But what I got the PR department on the phone, uh, uh, an Australian woman who sounded hot, because they all <laughs> they all sound hot, they do. I think. I, they're Australian. Everyone that I've heard. Australian. Yeah. Anyway, I was like, Hi. You're Australian. I'm like, can I record? I didn't ask her to record the call. Hey. Hey. I was like, oh, excuse me. You're Australian. I better change into this voice. Who do you (laughs) think you are? My sexy voice. This is my sexy voice. Hey, baby. Hey, what are you doing later? You want to go see the uh, marsupials mate? Oh. Oh, yeah. You want to pet me like a koala bear? You want to put your phone on speaker and sit on it? Mm. Steven, <laughs> that was uncalled for. Yeah, the one time I say something uncalled for <laughs> and you call me out for I'm it. I'm just kidding. I'm not calling you out for it. That was kind of funny. <laughs> Very stealing from, from Howard Stern. Like anyway, you do all so the time. I, I cite my examples. I, uh, I, I called, I got her on the phone, and I was like, I just got. I have a couple of questions. I am a website that makes money. I make money off of ads. I make money off of selling my own product. Am I considered a commercial entity and I cannot post those images from Getty Images? So she explained to me what commercial use meant. And that means if you are using any of the images from Getty to try and sell something. So if I grabbed a flash photo image, somebody holding a camera that Mm -hmm. was a flash, and I embedded that on my sales page for the flash guide and was trying to sell the flash guide using the images, that's considered commercial use. Got it. 
She then went on to explain that editorial use, even though you're making money, is different. Because if it's editorial, then you can use those images, embed them on your site, and it's for editorial purposes. It doesn't matter if you're making money on your site. You're not using that image to explicitly try and sell something. Yeah. So that begged the question of, well, what are you thinking? What are you guys hoping to gain from this? And she's like, well, with all the people just right-clicking and stealing images, you know, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the exact quotes, you can embed the images right on the page. And you can and Getty, it, it gives you proper attribution. It gives the, uh, the link back to Getty. And I'm like, well, what do you think is going to happen? She's like, well, we hope that regular people and bloggers will post these images. And then people, if they want to license them, will end up clicking on it to then come back to our site to go ahead and buy it. I'm like, there's no way in hell that's going to happen. But I didn't say that to her. I was just asking questions. And it wasn't about my commentary, which I'm learning. And I told you this, that getting better at not really butting in where I don't need to butt in there. Mm-hmm. Not, not as much on the, the raw talk. But um, <laughs> so she explained that. And it just... it. There's a play here, and the play is that they're trying to get more people's data because they can. If 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 these images get embedded on huge websites, then they get a lot of information and data that they can hopefully sell and mine and send and retarget people advertising. That's what they're hoping to gather here to sell. I don't. And, and then I was like, what about a site like Perez Hilton? They pay for a license for Getty. Why wouldn't they just get rid of their license and just embed photos that are available? Like we went to the Arcade Fire show. We can probably go on the website right now on Getty Images and embed those somebody's Arcade Fire images. Yeah, you I can guess do we that could. at the radio station I if, if you I want. Wanted to, yeah, you know, and and she's like, well, most people with their website wouldn't want it linking back to somebody else's site. I'm like, who cares? It, who cares if it links back to Getty's site? That doesn't matter. It's not like it's an ad that's linking back to some no, random. No, it's page. just the image. So. From what I've read on a photo editor, which is a, 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 an actual photo editor who puts up a lot of information online, mm-hmm. he feels that it's a play for them to get advertising to then turn around and sell the company in a couple years because they need to bring the value up because it's not, as, it's not worth as much as the couple billion dollars that the company paid for them a couple years back. Yeah, because we, uh, we have a subscription also on the radio station's website that we use on occasion, but it's like, what's the point? when we can just embed these images for free non-commercial use. Yep. And just like I was saying last week, um, I, I guess when it is an editorial or newsworthy thing, it's it's okay to actually embed them. So. Yep. Yeah. The last thing? Uh, last thing you wanted to talk about is the Terry Richardson thing. Uh, he's under fire this week uh, for a model, I think, who spoke out about him. Yeah, she's not the first model to speak no, out against Terry all. Richardson. There, There's so much information that you guys can put out there. This is the first time that he actually responded back. Uh, you can read his statement on our site, I guess, right? I'll post it, if I guess. Yeah, you'll post it. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we have the information. You can read what he wrote. So basically, Terry Richardson has been under fire for, from, for a long time for models saying that he either took advantage of them or they were that he allegedly raped them. See, that's how you use allegedly, by the way. <laughs> allegedly raped them. And I don't, I don't know what's right or wrong. I don't know what the situations were. So I can't tell you who is right here and if he did do these things. Now, of course, if that did happen, that's not a good thing. But he made $57 million last year off of images. So people are continuing to hire, th- hire him. And his article, what he wrote is about witch hunts online that he felt like it was time that he had to speak up to defend himself because he hasn't done that in the past yeah he never has what happens is if you don't say anything people think that you're automatically guilty Mm -hmm. and then there becomes this huge witch hunt where people are like yeah you did this and you do that and you're evil all right well he has his side of the story the girls have their side of the story you can read into it any way that you want to it and make up your own judgment i'm not making any judgment at this point and the fact is i actually reached out to his studio to see if we can do an interview don't know if it will ever happen but maybe we'd go up there and interview him and i wouldn't even talk about any of this allegation bullshit it would just be talk about photography because that's what i'm there to talk about and then if it ever comes out that he did something wrong then then you acknowledge that at the time yeah but the, the, the stories are amazing that you find about Terry Richardson. Unbelievable. I mean, there's photos of him taking pictures of girls while having stuff done to him. It's mm-hmm. it's insane. But hey, if, if that's the lifestyle that, that they were living and everybody was on the same page, then it is what it is. Yeah. I'm not here to tell you what was right, what was wrong, who's right and who's wrong at this point. Just bringing up the fact that he wrote a defense of himself 
and put it out there online. And there's no actual lawsuit or anything going on, right? It's there, just that is correct. It says that, that there is no lawsuit because she was a the girl that in this case was a willing participant in whatever was going on. Exactly. Yeah. Because she didn't say no, mm-hmm. I believe. And and you know, rape is a major issue. Oh yeah. It is a major issue, and there are there are lots of situations where it happens and girls are not taken seriously because they just for whatever reason or or the other but you know that it's not good either way no. when that happens yeah. so so that's it for uh photo news this week all right so that's photo news that's a lot of stories what we yeah, are going to do right now is we're going to get ready to run you the modest yahoo interview that we did modest came up to philly to do a photo shoot in my place in my loft we went to a synagogue around the around the city we shot here on the floor in the sun it was just him and his dad his dad drove him down his dad dropped him off his dad went to breakfast left him and it's like hey we're here to play (laughs) so modest was here we just hung out and took photos we did whatever you know um so that was great that was after i spent two days in la with him doing those photos i still haven't put them out because i haven't they haven't put them out i can't put them out until they put them out that's why i can't share them but he was here in my place so we ended up doing an interview and i got to ask questions that i don't think many other interviewers would ever get the opportunity to ask or would ever get an answer from because they're not they're not close and we've become close we've become friends over the past uh, three or uh, i guess three years and that's why it's a very easygoing interview there's a lot of stuff and i wasn't afraid to ask certain questions that you're going to hear to see if we could get the answers for you about them so what we've got coming up right now is an interview with modest yahoo uh, i want to let you know that if you are listening between Mar- on march 24th Noon Eastern Standard Time to midnight. If you go to modestyahooworld.com, you can download the Watch the Walls Melt Down. Yes, that's what it's called. The first single is Watch the Walls Melt Down. Download it for free on the website. Uh, You can do that. So go ahead, listen to this interview, and we'll be back to wrap up the rest of the show. Have Wheel of Fro, Gear of the Week, and, and, and actually premiere the single for you. So there you have it. Enjoy this interview. All right, we're going, Modest. Okay. We are on. I'm we're ready. good. I'm we're good. it up. So while Getting Modest puts nice on his... and wet, moisturizing the lips for this conversation. Okay. All right, we're here. Modest wanted to slide across the top of my table, which sits on the floor over there, but that wouldn't have been a good thing, especially with your 6'2 frame. Uh, are you 6'2"? Yes, 3, 4. 4? I'm 6'2 with my hair up. Nice. Did you know that? Anyway, welcome to my place. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. I know that we uh, we just got done shooting in, in L.A. for two mm-hmm. days, and you wanted to get some extra stuff here, so you came over to my place where we had some great morning light, uh, and thank you for coming down. You're welcome. So, we've known each other now for a couple of years. Yeah. Let's go back to the beginning. Now, this won't just be about you know photography and, and talking about how we met. I, th- I just think that that early on story is pretty darn important. Uh, the first time that we met, I spent the whole day with you uh, go through the process of how I got access how how that whole thing came about well management contacted me they said there's this guy uh, in Philadelphia I had these shows so you do these series of Hanukkah shows and uh, we played every year at, at pretty much at TLA in Philadelphia in Philadelphia and uh, management contacted and said there's a guy who wants to shoot you all day he wants to do sort of like a day in the life and um, He's actually, you know, pretty good. He's, and I think, but that did you have a following? You didn't have much of a following. It was small. It was smaller. Yeah, and so it wasn't really based on the following, but you know, he looked at the pictures and was like, "They're great." So, you know, you want to do it? And I was like, "Yeah, okay, sure." Um, and basically, you came out, shot. You know, I think you were there on my tour bus when I woke up. Yep. I think like I literally like opened my eyes and you were like, "Bank." I wasn't shooting yet, though. No, you weren't shooting. That, that's one of the things I do as a photographer is I wait until you're ready. Yeah, but you you definitely were, were there and ready. So you ca- caught me literally from brushing my teeth through my whole day, uh, walking into the venue for the first time, my vocal um, you know exercises that I did in the morning, shoe shopping in the afternoon, prayers and lighting the menorah and f- on the phone and the show and... and um, you eventually you put together this book for me as sort of like a thank you and to this day like if there was a fire in my house that's the one thing I'm taking with me because I just feel like 
you caught this episode of my life, this chapter of my life, and and a, and a, a chapter that most people don't see. Something people see you in the show, they see you in the concert, but there's all the you know the the back end, and you caught all the emotions and the actions and everything I was doing, and I feel like you know you sort of got that for me, and that, that's a real gift that you know obviously a photographer can give someone because as an artist you feel like there aren't many people that understand or can relate is a very alone aloneness to that you know but you, you got it all right there you know so that was pretty awesome thank you yeah that screw was, you bro screw me <laughs> yes thank you thank you for that can we no, curse on this or are we you not? can say whatever you want okay uh it is rated explicit on itunes yes so you can say whatever you would like now that was just one of those shows uh, the way that it happened was the publicist at the time i don't know who you had denied me access to the show they weren't going to give me a credential mm. so i got pissed off <laughs> i got pissed off and i said i have a couple of options i can just show up at the venue walk in the back door and ask for permission i could contact management or i just don't go at all because the publicist said well you're a photo website you're not a music website and i sat there and i said don't you realize that everybody has ears mm. and it doesn't matter whether it's a music website or a photo website people listen to music so that's when I emailed management and I wrote a nice email about this is who I am. This is what I'm looking to do. Here's where it's going to go. Let's work together. I wasn't asking you to pay me that day. No. And that was just the thing. It was like, I just want the access. In exchange for the access, I'm going to give you the right, give you usage of those images, yeah. which you guys used. Uh, and then it's led to a longer thing where you had me come out on the road. You flew me out to L.A. to do the shoots. You're here today. And, it, and it's just that big ass picture on the wall. I got it. I got that photo that day. Yep, that was just one of those things. That was, and that's epic. And that publicist has been fired, by the way. Yeah, that happens though. See, that it just it just it becomes upsetting as a photographer when you have the the background and the photos to prove what you're going to do, and yeah. then you say I've got a following as well, and it's going to go out there, and then they tell you no because I could have just let it all go and then we wouldn't right. be sitting here today because we wouldn't have become friends right and uh, on the other side from like more on the artist's perspective everyone and their uncle is a photographer today and wants access to shows and therefore you know wants to take photos so you have to be careful about who you let in and how many people are around and all that so you know there's always a skepticism when it comes from like when the photographer is approaching of like who are you who are you really sure and what is it really, how is it really going to help, help me? And in this case, it's worked out amazingly. In other cases, like you know, there are people that hang around and are always calling and always showing up and, you know. Well, what, what do you look for? Because like, I can imagine today with everybody having a camera, yeah. as the artist, what are you looking for from somebody? You know, you're looking for someone to capture the real thing, you know, to capture the authenticity and the honesty, for me at least, in in uh, in what I do, you know, and what I do in the music, and also on the back end of it all. So, um, so the way to really tell that is by looking at the photos, and if the photos are good, sure, the photos and are good. and that's what I tell people at home is that when you're going to reach out to an artist, they don't care if you write a don't write a novel, make it short and sweet. Hi, I would like to photograph you at this date, at this location. Here's who I've worked for, and here are examples of my work. If you don't have yeah. examples of your work, you can't vet them and say, oh, yeah, you're the real deal. Yeah, no, it's exactly. You're getting 30 emails, 40 emails a day with people telling all kinds of stories of what they want to, how they should be involved in your work and your project. And, you know, you're not going to read it. You're not going to read those. So you just want the information and you want to see the proof is in the pudding, you know. So you want to see the photos, you know. And if the photos are good and there's an opportunity, then, you know, you'll make sure. it happen. So uh, a couple summers ago or a, a tour or so ago, you guys had a different photographer at each location. Mm. Whose idea was that? Basically, we're getting all we are getting all these um, requests for photographers to come shoot. So, and we had the idea it would be cool to get shots of everything. We, obviously, we don't want to pay a lot of money. We don't ha have the ability to bring our we don't have the ability to pay our own photographer to bring them along on the trip, which is ideal. So, so and you're giving even fans you know who might be even new at photography like an opportunity to take shots, and you never know like who's going to get that great shot. So. Uh, so I think, I don't know if it was my idea or if it was, uh, we have a guy who works with us who sort of deals a lot with the fans. He's actually lives here in Philadelphia, Labe Medvin. Yep. That's his name. And, um, and so my, it might've come through him. I'm not sure exactly. All right. So let's, let's put the photo stuff to a rest for a minute and we'll come back to that later. You want to dive back into like your love of music. 
where did it come from? When did you start realizing that this is the direction you wanted to go? Well, I loved the music always as a kid, but I didn't think of it. You know, it's not something that you consciously think of like, oh, I love music. You know, it's just, you know, when music would come on, you know, I loved it. I loved performing and I loved, I just loved music. So that started young. I think when I was, uh, when I was about, uh, what was it? 11 or 12 someone bought me a guitar I didn't learn how to I never didn't learn the how to play the guitar and I loved music but I didn't know I didn't play any instruments and I didn't know how I, what I was going to channel how I was going to do it I started writing poetry writing rhymes and singing and listening to music and eventually I started singing writing my own lyrics and um, I started beatboxing I started like being able to produce music without an instrument, you know, through my body and not just mimicking sounds, but actually creating music, like hearing layered, you know, all types of, of, uh, you know, real music and being able to try to create that, you know, through a microphone, through effects with drums and all kinds of stuff. So I just sort of did it on my own, my own thing. And then I think when I was about, uh, when I was 16, I went to, let me think, before before that, there was a bunch of concerts I went to. I knew that I loved it, that I wanted to do it. But when I was 16, I went to this Fish concert, and uh, I think I felt at that point that I was destined to do it, you know, that that was, like, I had no option, that that was the only thing that would make me happy in, in life would be to follow this path. And um, that's what I did in my own weird kind of little way. And um, so let, let's move up to you start laying down your first tracks you you did that in philly yeah so when when i was uh when i was 18 i lived in oregon had a band uh played you know local bars and stuff in 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 eugene in portland you know humboldt like around that whole scene and uh started as a front man for this this band that we put together like sort of reggae rock kind of mishmash type of thing now did you have the beard did you have that whole look no this was pre-religious you know I look like I do now, but not gray. And um, and at a certain point, I just made a decision that I wanted to come back to New York and I wanted to go to school and uh, decided to, to leave. I came back to New York and just really worked on my craft. I couldn't find a band, no one in New York, you know, no one wants to. But I moved into to this apartment with, with a few girls that were in my college, in my class. One of them was dating this guitar player who went to the new school. We all went to the new school. There was a jazz program. So he, the, I used to go hang out with them, and I, I ended up becoming friends with this group of musicians who who were, a few of them were from Philadelphia. Aaron Dugan is one of them, and a, a bunch of other people. And they had a, a studio here with a producer here that they wanted to record some stuff with. So I, they wanted me to sing on one of the tracks. So I came down here with them. I sang on one of their records. I met this guy. Later on, you'll fast forward, like, I don't know what it was, six months or a year, I had become religious. I had become, you know, sort of transitioned into this whole new phase of my life. What made you want to do that? Um, You know, that's a long story. But basically, you know, I was, uh, yeah, you know, it's a longer story. But, you know, I I was just, uh, I got into it, let's just say. Sure. I came back here, and uh, on Fridays, we, we, there was, in the yeshiva, there was this thing where... You could le- you would leave the yeshiva to do this outreach, you know, and walk around the street. Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? And if so, hear Shabbos candles, put on tefillin, and the whole thing. And so it was all about outreach, outreach. And I said to like my my rabbis, you know, like this, um, I really want to make music, and you know, the ultimate. This is going to be the ultimate form of outreach. If you have a little vision, like walk down this road with me. Let me let me leave the yeshiva, and I'm gonna come record a couple of songs. So I came to Philadelphia first time, took the train down here, and went to that studio, recorded um, "King Without a Crown," you know, which is a yeah. big song, uh, first version of it, and stayed for Shabbos because it was Shabbos. I stayed down where we were today, right around that, with the rabbi. You yeah. know, slept in the rabbi's house. You went back up Sunday or whatever came down a couple times and recorded here so that was like the very start for me just getting those first recordings and at that time I was in this yeshiva I wasn't listening to music I wouldn't wasn't watching TV nothing the only thing I had was a disc man remember those yep a yellow one that you know you could the smash CD on one? the floor the CD that, one that, that if you had dropped. like 30 second skip protection yeah the sports one yeah so, so I had that and you know every now and then maybe once every week two weeks I would just sort of sneak off 
and I would listen to those songs that I had recorded while I was here. And that would sort of keep my, my vision alive of, of what I really wanted to do with my life. And how, does a, how do you end up getting signed? How do you end up, how does that whole process happen? So while I was, while I was in um, the new school, before I became religious, or as I was starting to get interested in it, there was a, a rabbi who was teaching classes on Hasidic Kabbalah and, and Jewish mysticism. And so I started, I went to one of those classes and I met um, some kids that went to NYU Music Business School, one kid in particular. And we kind of started a friendship. And fast forward, I went to yeshiva, kind of dropped off the, the planet. I get a call from him that he's gotten, he's graduated, he's starting this record label, and he's gotten a grant to promote Jewish music and wants me to be like his first artist. So they start booking me some shows and, um, you know, opening up for this person, opening up for that person. And what I was doing was such a mind bender, you know, that there was this Hasidic guy and I was giving so much on stage and energetic and the music was good and it was, you know, pretty authentic. So it very quickly created a buzz. And um, before I knew it, you know, I was selling out shows in New York, you know, small, smaller places, but Mercury Lounge, BB Kings, Irving Plaza, the smaller venues, but there would be a line around the door, you know, to get in. And um, once that happened, you know, agents saw, take notice, agents signed me, we go on tour, I bought a van, you know, we went on tour for four or five months. Um, and during that time, labels became interested. There was a bunch of labels that were interested. And, uh, you know, actually, finally, one of them was, you know, Loud Records? Yeah. You know, it was like Wu-Tang's label. So when I was in college, I, my cousin's friends with the guys that run that. They grew up together. So I went in to try to get a record deal and played them some music I had recorded. And I remember the A&R, you know, there who was just like trying to, he was like, I don't get it, like this white kid rapping about like slavery and all kinds of st stuff and like you're Jewish and like what does it have to do like how does it you know and then you know three years later they were like knocking on the door trying to get a record deal with me and I was so much more Jewish at that point you know it was like funny but um so yeah so then so then the label started coming around and mostly it was like indie labels at first and there was one one label that I really liked you know um signed a deal with them while I was out on that first tour we recorded live at Stubbs in Austin, uh, turned it around real quick. It was like a live record and it just, I was, a few things that happened. I was on the Jimmy Kimmel show. That was like one of the first videos that really went viral. You know, it was like a viral video. That was like a new concept. Do, do you think it had to do with the, uh, the shock value going on? Yeah. That was a big, like, look at this Hasidic guy make, you know, making this music. So but that, that wasn't like a shtick. That was you. It was at that time. Very real, very real, and still is very real to me and has always been. So, you know, I never played it up. You know, it was just what it was. But it, it grabbed heads, it drew attention, and then, and then people started listening to the music, and they were like, okay, this is good, we like this. So there was that. I got pulled up on stage with Trey at Bonnaroo uh, on Saturday night in front of 50,000 people and saying, no woman, no cry. And there was, there was a few different things, big pieces that happened. And before I knew it, that live record was selling like 30,000 copies a week. Um, what, what year is that? This is 2005. So it's still at that point, people are buying stuff. Still, yeah, it was still, still it was on its way, starting on its way down, but people were still buying records. Because that, that record was just huge. I mean, that's what everybody, the first introduction yeah. of you was really the, the whole live from Stubbs, which you don't yeah. normally see a live album as the, as the major album to start. Yeah. No, it's one of the... I think like top five highest selling live records of all time. Really? Right? Yeah. Um, so it, uh, it did, it did, it did great. It started taking off and right away, which I didn't know the deal that I had allowed Epic, the major label to upstream, mm. which meant that any time a record was sell after the record sold beyond a hundred thousand copies or whatever it was, they could take me on as a, as a major label art, you know, major on the majors. Sure. So basically they did that as they saw before it ever hit a hundred that, you know, whatever it was, they saw it was taking off and then, you know, what, you know, went in, recorded a, a real record, you know, which didn't do as well as the, the live record. You know, all the, the labels try and figure out how do we make this bigger than it is. Right. And they sort of squashed it in, in that process. You know, 
they spent I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars on a video that was unnecessary. You know, they, they, uh, you know, I don't want to get into to all of it, but we ended up releasing a record on top of the live record when the live record was still selling 25,000 copies a week. And it sort of just split it. And then, you know, I didn't let the indie thing sort of like happen. Just happen and keep growing. Keep growing. No, I just, is, is that your choice or do you have the A&R guys and the, the label people just saying, this is the right thing to do? You, you got to follow this method. Yeah. I remember like the guy who walked me into the, into the major and he was like, basically, you know, a uh, major label, they're, they're a marketing machine and a bank. And that's what you're going to use them for. And you use each other, you know, and, but, um, you know, you learn a lot in retrospect and the whole thing for me, you know, 10 years in or whatever, it's been learning process. Yeah. You, you learn as you go, you know, especially when you start out young and naive. Yeah. So you go through that whole process, you make those albums, they, do they come to you one day and be like, well, this isn't working out. We want to, uh, go a different direction or do they, they can upstream you. Can they downstream you? They can drop you off the label. But at that point, do you owe them? Do you owe them money back for advances if you can talk about stuff like that? You. Because I've read books on it. Yeah. So you. So. Um, you pay them through your record sales. So eventually, you know, you'll never have to go to the bank and write them a check. But, you know, I don't think I got paid anything off of all of those records because it has to be recouped until I got dropped and they stopped spending money. Once they stopped spending money on me, the records eventually recouped all the money that they were spending. And now I make money from those records and I don't know how many, they don't sell very much, but I make money on them versus when they were selling, you know, more tons of records. And you know, I never saw. So that's what the industry, I mean, you're not on a major major now, correct? No. You're on an independent? Yeah, Caroline Records. So it, it's, you kind of realize that these big major companies are just dumping money and then you n- kind of don't see a lot from you it. You don't have control over it. So you don't, you don't have any control as to whether or not you're going to spend $10,000 on a photo shoot or $50,000. Well, know, can you spend fifty and give me a call? Because <laughs> I've, never, I've never been in that place where they're like, oh, major label, we've got fifty grand, make it happen. 20 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, you're in the wrong generation. Yeah, but, but I found my way also. You did, yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which, is, which the, is better because yeah. you don't have to answer to anyone. And that's exactly it. So when you're, when you're going, you're in the process of uh, preparing for a new album. I believe it's full. Is it all recorded? Mm-hmm. Um, what is the writing process? What kind of place do you try to get into to come up with new music? Real life, you know, real life without any uh, pillow. You want to experience yourself r- raw, you know. Um, you want to experience the world raw and it, while there's always the draw and the pull to make things easier for yourself and soften the blow, part of what makes us artists, musicians, is the sensitivity that we have to this world, which can, which can be painful. So there's always a pull to, to dull that down. But to, make, to me, going into a process of writing a record means being sober, you know, and, and really kind of just experiencing life as what it is. I try to get into therapy. I try to get sort of deep into my own subconscious and into my inner world and have real experiences, real struggles, and, and then write music from that place. And, um, and, and like, to me, you know, the more, the deeper you get into life, the deeper you get into connecting with the reality inside and around you, obviously the better the music is going to be and the better the record is. So it's sort of like a sacrifice and it's sort of like, how much are you willing to put in? Not just, not just on the actual side of making the music, but how deep are you willing to allow yourself emotionally, you know, to get at this phase in your life? Sure. And how have the kids affected the music writing process? Like my children? Yeah. Um, you know, specifically, I, like on this record, I, I wrote a song for my son, you know, which is probably the most emotional record song on the record, you know, that I've ever written. So... And I didn't plan it, you know, I just, I happened to be listening to this music, this track, and I don't know how, but I started thinking about my middle son, my seven-year-old, and uh, the lyrics all just started flowing as like, what I want to say to him, what I wanted to tell him, what, what, what kind of advice I could give him for his life, you know, and how, how I see him. You know, a kid wants to obviously be seen by their parents, and I tried to just express, you know, what I see in him through that music. So, yeah. And anything you want to say about the new album? 
The album's called Akeda. It means literally uh, the binding, which is the sacrifice that Abraham makes in, at the end of his life by bringing his son up to the mountain. And um, recorded, you know, Brooklyn, L.A. Yeah. Uh, and, and so when we went out to L.A. and we did the photo shoots, it was, it was, it was pretty interesting, obviously. I mean, I stayed with you, which was great. I actually slept in the bu- one of the kids' bunk beds. The top was, bunk? Top bunk. The top I stayed bunk. in the top bunk. Yeah. And they were in your room, so... That was kind of cool. We we spent two days just going around shooting. Yeah. It was, it was pretty cool. I mean, how did that, you know, it's cool how that happened. Like, I didn't want to have a stylized photo shoot. Like, I've done those. I didn't want to go to a hotel lobby in Miami or go, you know, into a studio and get all the wardrobe and the makeup and do a whole thing. I, I think the best photos that have been taken of me have been captured you know, either live on stage when I wasn't watching, when I wasn't aware there was a camera in the room. And so I was just like, dude, you know, Jared, he's, he's probably taking the best photos of me ever. And, you know, he's a cool guy. And I'm sure he'd be into it. Let's just come hang out for a couple of days and take photos and walk around different settings and backgrounds and, and do it that way instead. It was, it was a cool process. And, and, I, and I told you this earlier that I always worry. We, we went through the process. We're shooting pictures. I'm looking at the camera and I'm like, am I getting what I need? Oh, yeah. You were, you were definitely, I could see there was like some inner thing going on with you where you were like, am I going to get this? Well, this that's not a good work? thing for me to portray to, to the artist that I'm shooting. It's You're not, supposed no. to, to portray <laughs> that confidence. But I had, you know, I had the manager standing there checking, wanting to see what Who's I got. Who's a photographer sort of as well. Yeah. You know, so he, or, you know, at least. He portrays one on TV <laughs> or wants to be. Which one, he's Jason? Ta- Jason, he he always has his camera. He's t- he, I wouldn't call him, he's not a photographer, but... He's married to one. His his wife is a photographer. He, and she took the fascinating, the cover of The Last, of, the of, last. of Spark Seeker. Yeah, the Bedouin girl. Did I say it right? Co- yeah, Spark yeah. Seeker. That photo is insane. Yeah. I, co- I couldn't, I saw that and I was like, well, usually I see other people's work sometimes and yeah. I'm like, eh. no. But when I saw the eyes and the, the processing on that image, she did a fantastic job there. Cool. But no, the, the whole process that we went through, when I got home and sat there and edited, I was like... I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Time after time, time and time again, in every location we had, there was that shot. Yep. Yeah. And that was, what did you think the first time you saw the pictures? Thank God. Because I knew, I knew that you were killing it, but I, I felt like I wasn't uh, just in the greatest space in my life. You know, I was kind of down. I was like, just not feeling wonderful. And so I was like, you know, it doesn't matter how good the photographer is. If, if I feel like shit, I must look like shit. And, um, these aren't, I don't think this is, I mean, I believed it would come out that you would get those few shots, but it wasn't like when I looked at, when I looked at what they sent and I was like, Oh, these are like all pretty awesome. Like they're great. You know? Thank you. And, um, so I was happy about that. I I don't let that be a lesson to you though. You know, other artists out there, like, you know, you can't rely on the photographer that he's just going to capture it every time. You got to do your part as well. Yeah, it, it's mutual. I mean, you know the ways to look, and, and that really helps me find the image when I'm out there shooting. Because, yeah. you know, I don't like setting up shots. Yeah. And a lot of what we did were were, were candids, yet they were kind of set up. Right. Because we're like, we're going to go to this location, we're going to walk around, we're going to find it. Right. But that's kind of what you have to do in order in order to get those type of shots. Sure. Before we move into uh, photographer side of it, where you talk of, on the other side, what it's like as an artist, do you want to talk about the whole process of de- the decision that you went into to shave? Because I know oh. it was this thing. Yeah, I mean, whatever. Uh, you know, I, I had this beard because I was... I was uh, when I grew my beard originally, I was uh, becoming religious and becoming interested in my identity as a Jew. And I, there was a, a strong pull towards the Hasidic thing because I just related to that that uh, whole thing, you know, and the wildness of it and the joy and the experiential, like an, an emotional, experiential, um, living Judaism, you know, like religion and spirituality that, that isn't on the side, but that just completely takes you over. And, and that, that was attractive to me. And I grew my beard and I took on the look, you know, and, but initially it was like I had my own clothes, but I, I wore a yarmulke, I had a beard and I created something that was sort of original to me. And then at a certain point, as I got deeper and deeper into it, I felt I had to sort of erase my identity out of the picture that I had to nullify, self nullify. So at that point, I changed, started dressing in a suit. I started the whole thing. 
and I was so this anti everything in the world, you know, like I'm not going to get into fashion. I'm going to wear these clothes, keep it simple. You know, any religious, you know, you know, uh, person w- would do sort of like pushing everything else away and trying to simplify. But, uh, at a certain point it became, okay, like even if I want to shave this beard, I can't do it. There, there are these rules and it, it's not allowed. And, and it's just, you know, so I felt I had to have the beard, you know, and, and that was for years and years and years. And at a certain point, I just sort of kind of took my life back and just said, I'm going to make my own decisions about my own life now. I'm not listening to anyone else anymore. You know, I mean, I'm listening, but I'm not going to do what, you know, what I'm supposed to do or what the rules are. And I just sort of, I grew out of that, you know, sure. Idea, you know, way of thinking. And at that point I shaved, you know, so. All right. Yeah. Sounds good Just there. Back. Um, so do's and don'ts for photographers, because we don't get to usually hear the perspective of the artist that's on stage, the one that all the cameras are pointed at. What are some do's and don'ts for photographers shooting in the pit? See, I think a lot of artists are different. You'll see like, especially like a lot of hip hop artists and stuff like that. And they play up to the camera. They love the camera. They're able to sort of like, you know, forget that everyone else is there and sort of focus on the camera, work to the camera or not pay attention and not even care about it. Like I've seen like method man, you know, like put his foot on, on a, a photographer's shoulder while he was rapping and the photographer was taking pictures. And to him, he, it was just a footstool. Like he didn't even think of the photographer and the pictures being taken. It was just, to me, I get distracted easily. And there's a lot of artists like that where you're trying to get like into your zone. You're trying to get into your focus and anything that's sort of abnormal or people, anyone that's wanting something from you specifically, like if you feel they want something or they want to be noticed or that they want your attention, it's distracting. And some people are over able to overcome that and other people get pulled down by it. So as a photographer, you, you know, I don't know, I would think you never want to be the person who's pissing off the artist and kind of screwing up their show. And uh, while you might think like, oh, he's a, he's a, he's an artist. He's supposed to just get over it. You know, he might be a great singer, but he might not have the ability to do that. You know what I mean? So to me, fly on a wall is like always the way to go in any, you know, thing is like to never even see the photographer, to not know they're there. The photographers that are there that, you know, would rather be on the other side of the camera are the ones, you know, that are there they're trying to get attention and those people just piss you off. So you look at me, I've got a big Afro and I walk around and I'm not very fly on the wall esque. but what's the difference? Well, when you, sh- your art obviously comes first, like your the authenticity of what you do. And to you, I know like you're trying to, you're trying to find the honesty in that moment. You know what I mean? And the other stuff about you is just, all, I mean, it's cool. It's just part of who you are as a person and how you promote yourself and all that. But when you're doing your work, you're not that guy. You know what I mean? Yep. I absolutely. I, it's, I'm quiet. I'm just observing the yeah. image, you know, looking for that next shot. So three song rule is a big thing in, in concert photography. What's your take on the three song rule? Um, I mean, I think I might have the three song rule instated, but it doesn't make much sense to me. Like, I think, you know, you want, you want, I feel like you choose one or two photographers, whatever it is. You don't have a whole pit of photographers, but you choose your guy and then that guy should capture the whole show. And, uh, when we have that guy, we do that. You know what I mean? We let him roam around on the stage. I want him to get angles from behind the drummer and like cool stuff, not just from in the pit. You know what I mean? So, but when you've got magazines and you've got, let's say 10 different outlets or 20 outlets there, you don't want a pit full of photographers there for the whole show, especially when there's sort of like a barrier between you and the audience. Let's say there's a six foot pit between you and the audience and all the photographers are in there. Sometimes you feel like there's sort of a wall between you and the crowd. So you can put up with it for two or three songs, but then you sort of like, want it cleared. You know, for me, I always want that space cleared. You know, if there's a security guard in that space, I tell my management, get him over to the side. Like, I don't want anyone between me and the audience. I want that space to be direct. All right. So that, I mean, you, you answered pretty much everything I had to say. Three song rule, how not to get in the way type of stuff. Uh, what do you, is there anything else you want to add 
in general to the interview? Um, no. No. Because <laughs> the, the one other thing I had was talk about hockey. I mean, where, how, how does hockey, where did hockey come about? I loved hockey growing up. I played ice hockey. Um, it's just the greatest sport in the world, hands down. I love if you're, it. If you know about it, if you're exactly. tied in, if you're tapped in. And, um, you know, I became a, a Kings fan. I moved to L.A. the year they won the Stanley Cup. So I started bringing my boys to games, and they became fans. They know all the players and the scores, and so I, I became a fan. And now well, the kids Once, once they played one of my songs in the stadium, that was kind of... Oh, were you there when they did that? Yeah. I Which, mean, they what did they play? Live Like a Warrior. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's great. And uh, I became close with Luke Robitaille, and he gets us tickets and all things. So. Yeah, he's a good guy. I've, I've met him once. Yeah, and you're you're a ref. You're a referee. I still do ref people, Do people know that? About uh, you, or is that like a fun little fact I'm exposing? No, people do know it because I've okay. done it. I've, I've talked about it before, and I've actually run into some of my readers when I was leaving the <laughs> rink, which is interesting because I, I just go out and ref for fun. Yeah. Now I go out for fun. Before it was like, yeah, I made money. It was a great job to have. Yeah. Better than working at a uh, supermarket or something because mm-hmm. you could get like 40, 50 bucks a game, which isn't bad. Do two games in a row. You're leaving with 100 bucks. Not bad at all. I yeah. Now I just love getting on the ice because it clears my mind. Yes. I don't have to worry about the the website for at least an hour and a half, which is a big part of my life is thinking about business and the website and how it all operates. But when I'm out there having fun, just skating, especially with the kids, you mm-hmm. know, they're, they're 10, 9, 10, 11 years old. They're not cursing you off yet. The coaches may be, <laughs> but the kids are just out there having fun. And all I want to do is have fun and skate around. That's awesome. Yeah. So I think we're going to, I think we're going to wrap it there. Thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, thank you. Maybe we'll end up on the road together again. Yes. All I'm right. sure we will. Boom. Bang. So there you have, that was the interview. That was, I love doing interviews in person. It's one thing, again, to have a Skype interview, but to have Modest sitting across from me in my own loft, in my studio here on Raw Talk is what it's all about. That was a great, great interview. And as a photographer, we we tied it into photography. We learned what he thinks about the three song rule and what his experience is on the other side of the camera on stage, being the guy that's having his pictures taken, what he feels like when he's out there having people shoot his images. We also talked about the music business. It's really fascinating to hear an insider's view of what's going on. He's toured for the past 10 years and to hear about the albums and, and, and just the whole business side of it is it's fascinating to me. What did you think? Yeah, just to see his side of the story is, is what really amazes me. I mean, because we're always on the opposite side, especially in the photo pit and that kind of stuff. And to see his take on the photographers and and that whole thing. I mean, it's, it's really cool to see the artist's perspective. Right. So what was that? <laughs> that was a loud vibrate. That was your phone. So I guess I'm good. This is why we don't put my phone over here because I get texts and stuff. Or get I, I get Tinder distracted. I get Tinders. Tinders. Tinder. I wonder, wonder, Tinder, Tinder, Tinder. I thought you were going to sing Pipple's Timber or Kesha. It's going down. <laughs> I'm yelling Timber. It's like the Weird Al version. I'm bad at No, Weird Al's. He needs it's time for a new album, a new polka dance Weird Al. It's been a anyway, while. So the modest thing was great. Again, go to modestyahooworld.com. That's M-A-T-I-S-Y-A-H-U world.com. If you're listening on March 24th and you want to download the free single, the free the first single is called The Walls Melt Down between noon and midnight on the 24th. But go there anyway. You never know. You could listen to the track or whatnot. But we're going to premiere it at the end of the show. So if, uh, at the end of this episode, you'll get to hear the entire track just on the audio portion. So if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and listen to the download the portion on the on the website. You can listen to it right there where you can hear the entire track for yourself. Uh, so really appreciate Modest coming out to here. Thanks for giving us the time to do this. Yeah, that was And great. let's move on to Gear of the Week. I've got two things for Gear of the Week, Stephen. Uh, you told me one of them, I believe. Did you tell me both of them? Yeah. Oh, you probably did. I always forget which well, ones. Think Tank came out with some new bags. No, you didn't tell me these. Oh. Well, here, <laughs> hold that bag. You know what that is? Uh, an iPad bag? That's an iPad mini. Oh, that's right. Wow. Like sleeve bag. It actually has the Ooh, thing. It's got stretchy stuff. All right. Yeah, I love the stretchy stuff. So even on the back of this one, this is for the iPad the newer iPad. The regular iPad. The regular iPad, not the original iPad. Full size. There's there's the full size. There's also the one for the iPad mini. It's got the stretchy thing on the front. It's got zipper pouches. It's not much bigger than the actual iPad pad itself. I love the bags that they make. Like This would be cool for traveling and, and 
and and just really throw it into a briefcase. Not that anybody uses a briefcase anymore, but to throw it in your camera bag. Well, this you is your space. briefcase now, you know. Yeah, basically. But they also have the ability to attach this to your uh, your belt loop, not your belt loop, but your. Uh, Right here, they've got this plastic thing right here on all their bags. This goes into the the belt, the the shooting belt. You know, you can put lenses there. You can also oh. attach your iPad there. I guess if you're an iPad photographer or something. So those are two things that they came out with. Then they had one other thing, and they're calling this one the Module PPR, which is Pixel Pocket Rocket. I don't like this at all. What actually. is that for? It's a card holder module. It's smaller. Oh. You hmm. see, but what I don't like about it is how am I going to get to these cards down here at the bottom? Yeah, they're, it's well, awkwardly, especially if you have bigger hands or they're, they're tough. Yeah, well, it, it, the, I mean, it's interesting. It holds one, two, three SD cards, which you can put there. Then I guess you could put XQD cards or compact flash in there. It's a little more awkward. I like the other Pixel Pocket Rocket that just folds up and goes into my bag. But this is actually... So I don't I don't the totally hate version. it, but it's the lanyard version that you can hang around your neck. You can put some business cards or whatever you need into the front portion. Well, they had them a Photo Plus, I think. I remember them wearing that on the front. Well, they may have maybe this was that, and they or were just something sneakily, similar. sneakily doing it. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure they were. I'm not sure I like the position and placement of the memory card. Well, they sh they should just basically let it open up completely instead of having this little web on I the agree. side. I agree. Yeah, because that is. I mean, I don't have the biggest the hands either, and that's. That's that was tough. the first thing I noticed when I pulled that out. Now, I like the two, you know, I like these for the iPad mini. I don't have an iPad mini. Oh, does it come with a raincoat too? Because every one of their bags comes with a raincoat, and it does. The one thing I do like about this, though, is, is the other ones that they have that fold all the way yes! out. You could easily lose a memory card if it just happened exactly. to fall out. This one, at least it'll stay in the pouch, so it's, you know, your pros and cons. It's um, about time. <laughs> They have a shower cap just for you in there. Oh, no. This isn't as good as the other shower cap that I normally use. Um, this one actually has, uh, you can latch on, I guess, make it a shoulder strap You can as make well. it, I, I'm sure they both could do that. Yeah. Anyway, so cool. that's that. That's one set. You can put those on the floor. And then the other gear of the week is what I got from Borrow Lenses. It is the 200 to 400 F4 VR $6,700 lens from Nikon. Did you say 60, what? 67. Wow. That's actually, I thought it'd be more expensive. Steven, where, well, Canon's version is $12,000. Yeah, it has I know the Canon's is converter. so, the brand new one is so expensive. This is a heavy lens. I handheld this in the pit. Feel, I that's what I handheld hand held in the pit. Oh so God. that's seven pounds. The camera itself is like four pounds. And so I had a lot of weight that I was hand holding because I didn't want to put curls? it on the monopod. You saw me in the pit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a huge lens. I've shot lacrosse now i've shot uh, maria with this and i've shot a concert with it it's an f4 normally not something i would keep in is the that bag why it's not as expensive because it's not a 28 well it's, it's they not as big no they couldn't make a 200 to 400 zoom yeah the only people that make a large zoom 28 are sigma they make a 120 to 300 2.8 they make a 200 to 500 2.8 is that the bazooka looking one it is it that $25, one is twenty five thousand dollars man so this is a big lens right yeah. Uh, it's an F4. I can compensate by having the D4S. I can bump the ISO. I was shooting at 10,000 ISO at the lacrosse game with the F4. The range is fantastic. Having 200 to 400 oh, is perfect. amazing. I would love it to be faster and sharper. I don't think it's as sharp. It's not as accurate as some of the smaller lenses because it's just a lot of hunk of glass, glass you have to move around. I'll have a full review on it. I'm assuming outside for sports at F4, this thing is going to be fantastic for football, for baseball. It's just a great range for that. But... Other than that, that's just the gear of the week. Well, I remember when you tested it on Maria, you were saying that it wasn't as sharp as your 70 to 200, say, um, or your 24 to 70, just because, again, it's there's so much glass involved in something like that. Yeah, it, it was, I mean, I don't know, some of them were sharp. It was just harder to get it, and that was, that was on a monopod with VR. It still just, I mean, I was on the other side of the studio, as yeah. you saw. Yeah, um, all so, the way on the other side of that corner of the gym. Yep, so I think it's time now, Stephen, for Wheel of Fro. Time for Wheel of Fro. I'll get it. Well, but time. Sutter's not here to get it, so you'll get it. <laughs> uh, so last week on the Wheel of Fro, it landed on the question mark. That was the first time that we've ever landed on the question mark, and I figure I have to tell you what the guy wanted. What He asked me if he could have the Fronos Photo Beginner Guide 
I ended up sending him both guides. Why not, right? I sent him both guides because he, he asked for one. And I guess that every week that it lands on that, I'm like, oh, well, they don't want that. I shouldn't assume that because I it is a fantastic value. People do love the guides and people do appreciate them and would love to win them. So I'm, I apologize. It's just that's just me. I don't want to win my own guide. So maybe I'm spinning for myself, but it's for somebody else. <laughs> it's gonna but say you're not the one winning. I'm not it. the one winning. So really awesome that he decided to pick my guide. That really painted a new picture for me and opened my eyes to the fact that that is a valuable thing in other people's eyes. So that's good. What, this, what I still think they should do, by the way, I'm, I can't even see you, but what I think they should do is maybe hashtag what they actual, actually want so when we do spin it and if they land on a guide and you want to give them something else, you can. Well, or, or maybe like if they land on a question mark, we know ahead of time than, yeah. than later. Well, that's a good idea. But the way that I'm having people sign up for it right now is... I am picking off the oh, list, the email list, yeah, of the email right. list for the, uh, the the DSLR video guide. So if you would like an opportunity to spin the wheel of fro, and you're also interested to in being on the list uh, of all the information that I will be putting out about the Fronos Photo guide uh, DSLR guide, you can go to fronosphoto.com/dslr-video-guide, and there's a sign up right there. That's where I picked the people to go this week. Uh, we've got this week a guy named Joe. A guy named Joe. Average Joe? Well, Joe from, uh, I guess it says Hacking Humanity. So he'll know who he is. That's who we're spinning for. On the wheel this week is the same thing that we had last week. We've got the question mark. <laughs> We've got Rode Microphone. Don't forget about their contest. $70,000 worth of prizes going on. How are we with time, Stephen? We're good. We got 10 minutes. Think Tank Photo, you can check them out. Alan's camera carries them. Adorama Pics, you can get some uh, photo books and illuminized prints. Borrow Lenses gives us a, a, either $200, $250. I still haven't asked them. I forgot. I think it's $250. <laughs> I really do. Squarespace, go to squarespace.com slash fro. You'll get a code. Use code fro or raw talk or fro tube to get 10% off you got the Fronos photo beginner flash guide you've got adorama pics again i've got a lot of them i need to replace them with like black rapid i'm gonna make this one black rapid oh yeah have we given away anything for black Rapid? no they yet? haven't verified it but i'm putting it on the wheel <laughs> i think that's how we got everyone else on the wheel is that i'm gonna put it on there and then i'll, I'll talk to them later about it exactly i'm drawing black rapid on this one Black Rapid. So are we ever going to have like non-taped <laughs> pieces uh, of paper on there? Maybe when my my desk gets officially made, I'll break out that Canon printer and print out actual stuff for it. Yeah, and actually cut them. And, then and like, actually cut it to these, look you like can, it. These are, this is plexi. You can just pop it right in. Uh, right? Yeah, you can. But I like when it's on the outside. It is plexi. You can slide it in the hole. Well, you like the, the 3D effect? I do. So <laughs> you've got uh, Black Rapid, another beginner guide, Think Tank, Road... And we've gone to, oh, Lexar. Can't forget Lexar's on there because I hooked up my Lexar hub. I did and too. I, I'm loving the thing. I'm loving the fact, and for anybody that's out there, you don't need to use Lexar cards in the Lexar hub. In fact, I don't own a Lexar card. I know Steven does. Yeah. I have XQD, which only Sony makes, even though Lexar says they make them. They really don't. Uh, I mean, they do, but they don't. But they really don't. <laughs> um, uh, so... I have. I love the fact that I've got an XQD card reader, an SD card reader, and two compact flash card readers in this thing at once. So I can just pop from one card to the other. I was transferring files from the GoPro right to Steven's cards so that he could take them home. So I love that thing. Yeah, it's much easier than having four separate card readers. And I was doing it yesterday. I transferred four cards at once from the Maria shoot that we did. And it was blazing fast. I mean, USB 3, it, I think I was transferring at like 100 megabits a second. It was pretty fast. It was awesome. Yes. That's it. That's they're not, they're it. That's not a sponsor. They're just on the wheel. Uh, Are <laughs> no. you ready to spin? You want to put your microphone yeah, up there? Yeah, you're good. All right, here we go. I'm going to move this out of the way. Spinning for Joe. Wheel of Fro. You know what? We should have had the hipster call in. And it stops on a Think Tank bag. All right, Think Tank. Congratulations, Joe from HackingHumanity.com. You have won a bag or something from Think Tank. I will be contacting you to get your address so that they can mail it right to you. All right, you want to remove the Wheel of Fro, Stephen? Yes, sir. And do you want to reset the clocks? Uh, no, we're good. How much time's left? Yeah. We have six minutes to wrap up the show. So thank you for doing that. Well, hopefully, maybe Sutter will be back next week. I thought this was another great show for us. Definitely be sure to go on to uh, 
iTunes to become a subscriber. That way, if you have it, or you could go on to you could go on to what's that other site called? Uh, Stitcher. Stitcher. Yeah. If you're on Androids and there's other devices that you can get to download it or instantly be notified as soon as they go live Mondays at midnight uh, for the audio portion, so that you can get it first. But Thank you to Modest Yahoo for doing that. Coming up in a second, we've got the release of that. Stephen, thank you for all your photo news. Oh, no problem. Uh, I think, what else did we do today? Uh, don't forget about Rode microphones. Check them out. Rode mics, your Google Rode microphone, so that you can check out the contest that they are running for you to win some $70,000 worth of prizes. That's great. And as well, check out the microphones that we use. And there's a reason why they are a sponsor is because I asked them to be a sponsor when we started using their stuff and we liked it. That's how we pick who is a sponsor on the site. When we like gear, we then reach out to them because it's just a perfect fit when we talk about things that we actually like. Mm -hmm. So we got that. We use the Atomos. Funny thing is, we had to send the other Atomos back. I know, we couldn't even use it. The Ninja Blade. The reason we had to send it back, we were going to keep it, uh, is the fact that they sold out of the first run that they made. That's and great. they need one to demonstrate at the uh, NAB show coming up in Vegas. So we had to send ours to them, and they'll send us a new one when it comes back into stock, which is a great thing to hear that they sold them out. Yeah, that uh, is. So that's cool. Thank you to alanscamera.com. How much time's left? You got four minutes. All right. I don't ever get to ask that anymore now I that know, Sutter's here. I know, and I let it go. I let him do his thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's just about everything that we have. To check out all the photo news, go to fronosphoto.com slash rawtalk hyphen 78 and that gives you this week's photo news so coming up right now is a world premiere in a world where we're gonna premiere some music and steven's gonna make a note at the end to make my voice go boom i should do the radio um i may have a special announcement right here for you who am i doing steve now <laughs> so what we've got coming up right now is a world premiere of Modest Yahoo's latest single off his album, Akita. That's right, the new album's Akita. Coming up right now is The Wall. Oh, see, I want to do the, I don't want to step on it. I, I'm not good on the radio. I haven't done a radio. So I want you to do the lead in, Stephen. The, the add in the voice part? No, no, no. Yes, but I want the track to start playing right at the right time when I'm like well, talking about it, you know, because I don't know how much lead time that's the there thing. is. I hope there's enough lead time. I think there is. Okay. I think there is. So how much time's on this? clock we're good now keep in mind this is only for the podcast this portion, is only for the podcast not for the youtube portion right so i better do my i'm gonna do my sign off first i'm gonna do my sign off first and then we're gonna do the rollout into this only if you're on the podcast only if you're on the podcast all right thank you guys for watching if you're on the podcast stay tuned for a special <laughs> uh release of modest yahoo's song if you're on youtube go check it out jared poland fronosphoto.com see ya <laughs>